Hi, how's everybody doing? Thanks for coming out. I'm, I'm still 18 years into this, continually surprised anybody would come out to see me. Um, uh, I'm going to just speak a little bit um, about uh, how I got here, uh, which, is a, which has been a very strange journey, given that I don't come from a literary background, uh, which, which uh, baffles a lot of people. I come from a very um, working class background. My parents were both uh, Irish immigrants. Um, uh, however, just to say that uh, I came from a working class background does not mean I did not come from uh, somewhat of a literary background. I came from a storytelling background, um, insofar as I grew up the child of Irish immigrants. And my parents came from massive, massive families. Um, <laughs> my father had 17 brothers and sisters. And uh, it's, the family was so big that the oldest brother and the youngest brother never met. It's true. <laughs> They never met, and the the, uh, the oldest brother had left the house by the time the youngest brother was born. He, he went to America. The youngest brother lived his entire life, and he went to London. And back in those days, he didn't just hop on a boat I mean, hop on a plane. They never met. Lived full lives. Never met. Um, my mother came from a comparatively smaller family, 14. Um, <laughs> and what they did was they all came over to Boston. Not all of them, but, but a, a, a large chunk of them came to Boston, and they started sort of an Irish relay. And they began to, the oldest one got over and started pulling the rest of them over. And so they all um, pretty much uh, hunkered down and in Dorchester, Massachusetts, which is where I, I grew up. And they all lived within about a, a mile and a half of each other. I'm talking like 10 to 12 brothers and sisters um, from both sides of the family. So when I was growing up, we would go, um, every weekend, we would just go to another aunt or uncle's house, or they would come to our house. And everybody would sit around, and they would um, drink highballs and schlitz and smoke Lucky Strikes and tell stories. That's what they did every weekend. Um, it, the venue would change. It would rotate out, but they would just sit, and they would tell stories. And you would know that they were drunk when they started singing Danny Boy. That was pretty much it. <laughs> and uh, so my... Um, uh, very early on, my brother and I began to notice something, which was that about every three to f somewhere between three and six weeks, the same story would rotate back in. It would come back into the rotation. But they would have tweaked it. They would have changed it. And this went on for years. They'd tell the same story. They'd just lie more each time. Um, so very early on, we discovered that, that my family had a... Um, uh, um, well, they just basically had very little respect for facts. Facts, facts weren't very big to my old man. He didn't, he didn't really put much stock in them. Uh, it, it was all about um, a type of, of, of search for an emotional truth, if you will. And it was years later when I was in graduate school that, I, that somebody said something to me that made it all kind of come clear, which was a, a professor who called writing the lie that tells the truth. Um, so very early on, I was exposed to the lie that tells the truth. Um, next, uh, in addition to that, was besides coming from an Irish culture, I came from um, the inner city of, of Boston. I came from Dorchester, Massachusetts, which is, is a very um, uh, unique place. Uh, <laughs> very working class, uh, pretty heavily I Irish influenced in my neighborhood, but also uh, a, lot, a lot of Polish influence as well. But um, so it was a bar culture at the end of the day. It was a working class culture where the guys at the end of the day went to the bars. So um, on Saturdays, Saturday mornings, my father would, t would go to the farmer's market in the city and, and get all the fresh produce for the week. And uh, my mother could never understand, or maybe she did and she just turned a blind eye. She could never understand why it took him so long, because my father had grown up a farmer. And my father could spot a bad eggplant or a bad potato from a mile out. And yet it always took him like two hours to go through the farmer's market. In reality, it took him five minutes. He, he, would, he would blow through it, and walking with me, he'd be like, catch the potato, take the potato, take, grab the tomatoes, come on, let's go. We'd blow through it in five minutes, we'd hop in the car, we'd drive down Dorchester Avenue, and we'd hit a bar. We'd go into a bar, and we'd hang out, and I'd be like nine or ten. And I'd sit up on the bar stool, and they would serve me a ginger ale, no ice, in a glass with a red straw, because it looked like what everybody else was drinking. And I would sit there, and I would listen to people tell stories. And that's what they did. And it was telling stories as blood sport. If you didn't tell a good story, nobody was polite about it. Nobody, 
Nobody listened as their eyes glazed over and thought about shopping lists. They shouted you down, or they told the bartender to turn the game back up. It, 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 was, it was fascinating to watch. And what I, what I understood then, or, or didn't understand then, but what I was taking in by osmosis was the rules of a good story. Um, the first rule was to engage the reader immediately, um, the, or to engage, engage your audience. You had to be telling a story. You couldn't start off with, well, one day, uh, I have friends or I have acquaintances who, who can't understand why they can't quite pull it all together as a writer, and as writers. All I got to do is listen to them and tell stories, and I know why. Because I'll have a friend who'll be like, I don't know, I've been working on this novel for seven years. And then she'll tell a story, and the story will begin. So I was out with my friend Francois and, and, and Bobby. Do you remember Bobby? No, we don't remember Bobby. Um, Bobby's brother. I don't know if you knew Bobby's brother, Jim. Oh, Jim was handsome. Jim. He, you remember, he used to work at the record store, and, and about 45 minutes later, you get back on track of the original story. I don't need to know why you're not completing your novel. It's because you don't know how to tell a story. So these guys knew how to tell a story, and one of the things was, again, you engage the reader immediately. It helped if the story was funny. The reason it helped if the story was funny, because the punchline of most working class people's stories, the true ones, is you got screwed. It is. <laughs> You got screwed. It's how you got screwed and then how you dealt with it. You know, you keyed the guy's car or you went and had an extra beer or you, you, your horse came in or whatever it was. But, but the, the punchline of the story is usually that you got screwed and, and, that, that, and that life is a bit of a joke. That God is a, is a trickster. And so the inauthentic storytellers would also get shouted down after a while. If you were constantly telling the story where you won, where you got the better of the man, they'd be like, Bullshit. Sit down. You know, you're always telling that same story. I don't believe it. I've seen your apartment. You didn't win any lottery. You know. So, so very early on, that was that was that sank into me. I um I then went off at, at some point, and I majored. My first major was journalism, and I discovered something that should have been clear to me, but no, no I only became clear to me in hindsight, which was as a journalism major, and this was a problem in the 1980s. Uh, I didn't like facts. I just, I wasn't a fan. I didn't, I didn't quite, I'd be listening to somebody, I'd be writing down what they were saying, and I'd think, I could say this so much better. You know, it's so much better. Um, so I, um, I, I dropped out of my first two majors, and then I had this, this wonderful safety, both safety majors, because nobody became a writer from Dorchester, Massachusetts. Nobody became anything creative from Dorchester. This is pre Wahlberg, Dorchester, Massachusetts. <laughs> Nobody, nobody went out and did something risky like that. Nobody left, essentially. You went to the state school, you went to UMass, and, uh, and then you, hopefully, if you were smart, you got a job with a utility or you got a job in, in government because basically you couldn't get fired. That was the theory. Everybody always need electricity and nobody gets fired from the government. So, um, so that was, that, and that was my dad's dream. And for years, I'm talking years, my father, as I moved forward into my reasonably successful career, my father, I don't, I own my own home. I had like five books published. My father would still be calling me every time the post office was having an exam. Uh, <laughs> he would, you know, he'd like take me aside after a signing and be like, you know, and I, I, you know, good crowd too. And he'd take me aside after signing and be like, you know, I hear Boston Gas is hiring, you know. Um, <laughs> So, um, but meanwhile, I, I, I decide I have this great revelation and may it happen to some of you or some of your children because I do think it's a great moment in, in, in my life. I realized one day I woke up and I realized, oh my God, I suck at everything. I'm only good at one thing and one thing only. That's making stories up. That's it. It's my only demonstrable skill. I, I'm a good pool player, but I don't think you can really make too much money on the circuit anymore, if you will. Uh, so I, I said to my parents, I went to my parents and said, you know, look, I think I'm going to take a leap and I'm going to go major in creative writing and I'm going to study writing, I'm going to study fiction. And, and they said, well, you do suck at everything else. So, <laughs> you know, will you get the degree? That was their big thing. My parents both had seventh grade educations. The dream was one of their kids would get that college degree. I said, I will get that college degree. So. I went and I got the college degree, and then I went further and I got a master's degree. 
And then I decided at the pinnacle of my sort of educational success that I was not going to teach, which is the only thing a master's degree qualifies you for. A bachelor's degree in creative writing qualifies you for exactly one thing, which is a master's degree in creative writing. <laughs> a master's degree in creative writing qualifies you to teach. That's pretty much it. Um, so I, um, I came out, realized I just wanted to take jobs that allowed me to concentrate on my writing. I didn't take them home with me. I didn't feel any emotional weight from them. And so I was going to go back home to Boston. I was living in um, Miami at the time. I'm going to go back home to Boston, and I'm going to park cars, and I'm going to write, which made my parents so happy. Uh, <laughs> you know, 28 years old, I got a master's degree, and I'm parking cars. But, but it did allow me to write. I stayed with it, and I had this plan, and the plan was that if I could just keep getting better, book by book by book, maybe the audience would slowly build, that I didn't have any other plan but that. Um, so, uh, and if I could tell, uh, the best story I could tell about my city as I understood it, because I was trying, I, I've been trying very much in my career to grasp, um, to sort of solidify maybe for the ages, the Boston voice. Boston is a, is a unique place. Any, any of you have ever been there, you might say it's a cold place. Um, and it is, but, um, and we're not talking about the weather, uh, but, it's, and everybody in Boston is just a little bit nuts. There's just no other way to put it. We're just all like a few cards short of a deck. And, um, and so there's a particular voice to Boston that I'm really trying to grasp. And um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to, I was in Miami and I was finishing up graduate school and I could feel the voice trickling away when I wrote about Boston. I was just like, I'm not, I'm hearing too much in my head that's not Boston. And I, I went back home. I thought, oh my God, I've lost the voice. And I ran into a buddy of mine. And I, and he'd always been kind of a brawler. And I said, um, you know, so how you doing? You know, and he goes, oh, I'm good. Well, I, I got stabbed. And, uh, <laughs> and I, and I said, no, what happened? You know, and he goes, well, I was at Sean's in Faneuil Hall. And I got into a beef with this guy, you know, and, uh, so he pulled a knife and he stabbed me, you know, and I don't know what you've heard, but, you know, getting stabbed can really take the fight out of you. And, <laughs> and I went, there it is. That's the voice. And there's two things about that. There's, there's number one, the I don't know what you've heard, as if possibly you may have heard that getting stabbed is a pleasant experience, like, <laughs> like going to a spa, you know. Um, and, and then the other possibility, oh, and then the other thing is the massive understatement, the incredible understatement, kind of takes the fight out of a guy. Not really hurts, oh my God, uh, just kind of takes the fight out of a guy. That's... That's Boston. I've been trying to um, I've been trying to show this to my wife, and uh, she's from small town New York, and then was living for many years in Florida. So she's she's uh, she's very um, uh, decaffeinated. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Boston is not for the decaffeinated. So I take her back, and we were staying in Charlestown, which is sort of my adopted neighborhood in Boston, is what inspired Mystic River. For those of you who've seen read it, um, and uh, Charlestown is this one tiny section of Boston, it's one square mile. And it was for years and years and years and years, right until the mid '90s. It was a um, extremely clannish. It it you it was 100% Irish. It was 100% poor, and nobody crossed the bridge. It's connected by three bridges to the city, and um, and it was it had the highest unsolved murder rate in America for 50 years. And it's not like many people got killed, but when they did get killed, nobody talked ever, ever. And there was even the Charlestown excuse. The Charlestown excuse was, "I was drinking," as in. They just shot your brother, and he was standing four inches away from you. Who did it? I was drinking. That was the Charlestown excuse. Um, so we're in Charlestown, and now Charlestown's completely gentrified, which is kind of what I wrote Mystic River about. It's completely gentrified, and it's like really yuppie, and the, and the, the, the real estate is extremely expensive. And, and uh, so we're living there, and my wife says, I don't see this old Charlestown you guys talk, you talk about, you know, or that we, she'd just seen the town too, you know, it was in the movie The Town, is set in Charlestown. So I don't see it. And I said, don't, don't worry, honey, it's here. Trust me, it's here. So we go to the playground. My daughter's like one years old at that point. She's just learning to walk, and we take her down to the playground. And as we get to the playground, I look, and I see this woman, and she's towny all the way. I can see her, and I'm like, all right, now my wife's going to see. <laughs> and she's, you know, she's just got the, the hair. It's got like three different dye jobs. It all went bad. Um, she's still wearing acid watch jeans in 2010. She's smoking a Benson and Hedges Deluxe Ultralight the size of a Scud missile. And, and she's got three kids, clearly from three different dads. And, 
And so she's sitting there and she sees us and she's like, how you doing? You know, I said, you guys have toonies. You know, that's what they call new people at Charlestown. We're townies, the toonies, the toonies, how you like it? And she's talking to us. And our, our daughter's just kind of learned to walk. And so she's toddling. And this woman's, uh, uh, two, one of, two of her kids are buzzing around my daughter in this plastic car. So we're talking to them, having a pleasant conversation. And then all of a sudden she just reaches out and she grabs the plastic car. And she says, you're scaring that little girl. You are scaring that little girl. You do it one more time. I swear to God. I am taking you back to the playground and the projects. We'll see how you like it. You get friggin' shot. <laughs> and my small town wife says, so, okay then, we're gonna leave. And, and the woman with her cigarette goes, God bless. Right? Uh, So that is the voice I am, I am trying to capture when I write. That has always been my ambition. That has been my sole ambition is people say, well, are you a crime writer? Are you a mystery writer? Are you writing historical fiction? Are you a literary writer? What are you? And I just, I don't know what I am. And if I knew what I was, I don't think I'd be a very good writer. Um, I don't think writers are supposed to fit. I don't think we're supposed to know exactly what we are. We're supposed to be the square pegs in the round hole or otherwise we'd never have become writers. So um, I... Uh, I always just say, if somebody, if I go down and they put on my headstone, the Boston writer, I'm good with that. I'm really good with that. Even though my new book is mostly set down south in Tampa and then in Cuba, and the book that follows is set in Tampa, I'm going to work my way back because already Bostonians are getting pissed. You know, <laughs> what are you going down south now, kid? You leaving us? You think you're better than us? Uh, we'll send you to the playground on the projects. So, um, So anyway, so uh, so this is as I'm as I'm as I'm going down through this 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 life that I'm leading this this writing that I'm doing. My father, meanwhile, still has no clue. Again, he's calling me about Boston Gas. No clue. My father did never read one of my books. Never. Um, he'd tell everyone when he did all the time. He'd be like, "Oh, I like that Mystic River." He'd be like, "You're lying. You never even cracked the front page." <laughs> you know? He said your mother liked it. You know? Uh, <laughs> My old man uh, never, and I couldn't take this personally because my old man never liked fiction. He liked, which is weird for a guy who loved to just sit every weekend and tell lies. Um, he never got this whole idea of dress up in movies where people were actually fake, playing, playing real people that we were supposed to believe. He never got it. I, I got him. He didn't like movies. He didn't like books. I um, dragged him to, I got him to finally take me to a movie. I got him to take me to Star Wars when I was a little kid because <coughs> I just harassed him non-stop. Finally, he takes me there. Ten minutes and he falls asleep. I don't know if you remember the first ten minutes of Star Wars, but the first ten minutes of Star Wars is the attack on the Imperial battleship. Darth Vader shows up the first time. My father just checked out, man. Nice nap. He left, we left the movie. He's like, I like movies. He's got a nap. You know, he's a working class guy. Got a nap, you know. Um, but yeah, he never, he never did. He, uh, so he never quite understood what it was that I did. It just baffled him at the end of the day. He was just like, you know, seemed to be doing well, but I don't see job security here. You know, that's what he did, couldn't grasp. I don't see job security. Um, I'll tell you something else about my dad. He was so um, uh, disconnected from pop culture in a wonderful way, in a way that I really admired, that this is what happened. When I finally sold my first book to the movies, I sold it to Clint Eastwood. I sold Mr. River to Clint Eastwood. And um, I called my parents, and my parents by that point had retired, they moved down to Florida, and they did something that some of you may do to your children. And if I can stop you from doing this to your children, I will have performed a public service. <laughs> and that is, they moved to Florida and they bought two phones. One for the living room, one for the back bedroom. And the idea was that when their kids called on Sunday, they would each pick up one of the phones. This, in theory, is supposed to help communication. But really what happens is you call, and then they say, Mike, did you pick up the phone? I got the phone. Do you got the phone? I got the phone. Who's calling? Dennis. Dennis. Oh, Dennis is on the line. Which room are you in? I'm in the kitchen. Where else would I be? Oh, well, well, I'm in the living room. I actually like to, and then they just have a conversation with themselves, and they forget about you. <laughs> this is what parents do. So I call my parents, and I, and I say, um, I just, you know, sold my books to the movies. You know, sold my book to the movies. I just made a deal with Clint Eastwood. And my mother says, oh, my. And in a tone of voice that suggests to me that she is attracted to Clint Eastwood, <laughs> which 
which I really never needed to know. And <laughs> it could have passed my entire life in great happiness, not knowing. My father, God love him, comes in and saves the day by saying, who's Clint Eastwood? <laughs> At which point they lose me. My mother says, Mike, you know who he is? He says, I don't know who he is. She says, he was on Westerns. My father says, was he on Bonanza? She says, no. And he says, then I don't know who the hell he is. Because Bonanza was the last TV show my father ever watched. Uh, my father would then go on to pay me the honor of, uh, of falling asleep at all three of my movie adaptations. Um, he fell asleep at Mystic. He uh, woke up and said, uh, your mother said it was good. You know. He fell asleep at Gone Baby Gone, woke up at the end. He said, what did you think? He said, your mother said there's too many F words. Okay. Fell asleep at the end. Shutter Island came up to him. What did you think? Your mother didn't know what the hell that was all about. <laughs> so... <laughs> but here's the thing he meets um, uh, <clears throat> when they made Mystic River they were just unbelievably uh, wonderful princely about, about keeping me involved at every step and uh, <clears throat> Clint uh, one day says why haven't you brought anybody by the set don't, don't you want to bring somebody by the set you know alright well I'll bring my parents by so I said, well that'd be nice so I show up the next day on the set and they're just the classiest outfit in Hollywood. They've got, like, uh, director's chairs waiting for my parents. They've got their names on the back, you know. And they've got, like, tea service for them and everything. And they sit and they sit in the director's chairs and they get the little headphones and they watch these scenes and these monitors being shot in the soundstage. And they do that for, like, half an hour, 45 minutes. And then finally Clint comes out and he meets them. And he shakes my mother's hand. And my mother immediately loses all power of speech. She just... <laughs> and just stares at her hand like... Like it had never been in her body before. And, <laughs> and then my old man, meanwhile, starts telling Clint, you know, how much he loves his films, how much, how much they've meant to our family over the years. <laughs> and I, my father was a charming son of a bitch. And I'm watching even Clint Eastwood, like, kind of grow like an inch. Like, he's, like, really charmed by this, you know. And thank you so much. And finally he leaves. And, and uh, my mother's still just standing there stunned. And I... And I looked over at my old man and I said, uh, you don't know who he is, do you still? And he said, no, I don't have a clue. And uh, I said, you just lied to Clint Eastwood. And he said, but I didn't lie, you know. He said, you, you, didn't you like his movies growing up? And I said, yes, I did. He said, well, there you go, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to uh, uh, bring up one last uh, uh, oddity of all this before I, I segue into the final point of this, and then we'll do some questions, which is uh, um, the other final thing that's happened in terms of uh, 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 lack of facts is, is now extended to Bostonians, and, and this is extended to my films. The weird side effect of my films is that now is um, if, if there's a, a movie and, there's a, and it's set in Boston, and there's a gun and a bar in it. I wrote it. It's as simple as that. I wrote it. I have received fan mail for The Departed. Um, I have. Uh, I have had several people thank me on, on multiple occasions for writing Mystic Pizza, um, which would have been amazing because I would have been about 17. Uh, and um, uh, so... Uh, I, I sometimes think poor Bill Monahan, not poor Bill Monahan, but Bill Monahan, who actually wrote The Departed and won an Academy Award for it, uh, and is from Dorchester, where I grew up. You know, I wonder if sometimes he's like, you know, in his room, just like pointing at his Oscar, going, "I wrote that," uh, <laughs> because I'm telling you, I get credited all the time. I was in a bar in Charlestown. It's called Old Sully's. It's actually in the movie um, The Town. It's the bar where they drink in the town, and it's about, um, it's not even one third the size of this stage. It's that small. And used to be a speakeasy. So if you read um, Live by Night, at the very end of the first chapter, he follows a woman to a speakeasy. It's actually Old Sully's. I based it on Old Sully's. So Old Sully's was a speakeasy, and now it's a, it's a bar and a two-story house, and you only know that it's there if you're in Charlestown, if you're a townie, essentially. So I was driving home one day, and I went in there, and um, I just popped in for a quick beer, and the bar, and there's two guys to my right, and they're shattered. They've been drinking. They've been day drinking. They started drinking at like noon, and it's like nine o'clock. And the bartender served me a beer, and all of a sudden he says, um, "You look like the guy who wrote Mystic River." And I said, uh, yeah, "Why not?" 
I am the guy who wrote Mystic River. Oh my God, that's the guy who wrote Mystic River and Shutter Island and God may be gone. And God, my right turns and, and says, the only thing that he will say to me repeatedly for the next 45 minutes, turns and says, hi, I'm Tim. <laughs> Shake his hand. The guy to his right stands up and he's shattered. He stands up and he comes strolling on over me. He's got that violent drunk look. He walks on over and he says, so you wrote The Departed? And I said, no, I didn't write The Departed. He gives me a look like I knew that. Like he might lay me out now because I corrected him. So is Jack Nicholson a prick? I have no idea. I didn't write The Departed. I never wrote The Departed. Nothing to do with it. Didn't know. Uh, then the bartender shouts him down. Says, uh, he wrote, he wrote, he wrote, he wrote Mystic River, you won't shut around. Sit down. Leave him alone. He didn't write the deposit. So he sits down. And the guy turns to me and says, hi, my name's Tim. <laughs> There's the guy standing in front of me again. And he says, so is Matt Damon shot? I have no idea. I didn't write the deposit. I have nothing to do with the deposit. I go home. I tell my wife that story. She says, honey, that's crazy. You know, who would actually think this? You know, I said, baby, actually, a lot of people think it. I get thanked a lot. I have fan mail. Um, so, uh, like two days later, she's out walking her dog in this little park near our house, and uh, a woman comes up to her and she says, "You know, we know who your husband is. Don't worry about it. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna tell anybody. You know, it's Charlestown. We keep the code, and it's true. I used to live beside a barber shop, and any time people would come by that barber shop and say, I heard Dennis Lehane lives next door.'" The barbers and all the guys who worked in the barber shop would say, uh, "No, no, that's the barber shop and the projects," and they'd send them into the projects. <laughs> It was a great place to live, man. I didn't even know it was home security, you know? Uh, so she says, uh, she says to the, my wife, she says, don't worry, we won't tell anybody, we'll keep it. But uh, I just, I was wondering if you could just do me a small favor. My wife says, fine. She goes, tell them how much I love the town. My wife's like, so now it's the town? Now I've written the town. Um, so anyway, so this is a long way of saying I have been steeped in a culture at every level that has a, no, no respect for fact, um, and B has just a very interesting way of believing that there's a constant revolving sort of uber, uber story going out there. And I think that, that this has now connected um, in the bloodline, because I have a daughter, um, I have two daughters now, but I have uh, the three-year-old, when she was about two, she figured out that she was seen on a monitor. She started figuring that out. So she was heard, certainly. She knew there was something tracking her in her room. So she would lay in bed, and we'd be downstairs, and had dinner one time, and all of a sudden we heard her say, I peeped. I looked at my wife, and I was just like, just change your diapers. She's fine. I have a boo-boo. She got like a minor scratch like a week before, and we let her keep wearing the friggin' Band-Aid, so no, she's fine. I need milk. No, she just had no, she's fine. I fall down. We can see her on the monitor. She's laying in bed. So I finally, I walk up and I say, Gianna, did you pee? She says, no, daddy. And I said, do you have a boo-boo? She says, no. Like I'm the idiot, you know. Do you need any milk? No, daddy. Did you fall down? No. So why am I here? Tell me a story. <laughs> Thank you. Let's take some questions. <laughs> oh, right. Anybody? Anybody want to be first? There's always got to be somebody. Yes, sir. My accent. Oh, yeah. It comes out when I'm tired. Um, okay. That's, there you go. Uh, that sounds like a Bostonian to me. Um, yeah, I lost my accent because I came, down to, um, I came down to go to school in St. Petersburg, Florida when I was 20. And uh, I, have a, um, I, have that, I have always had an ear since I was a kid, probably because I grew up a writer's ear. And because I grew up hearing people speak so vividly that my ear has always been really finely tuned. It's so finely tuned that if I'm talking to you, I will pick up the cadence of what, I will pick up your cadence. It's annoying. You know, I have to really work on it because I'll be literally talking to an Irish relative, you know? Suddenly I'll be like, oh, no, really? 
no, you didn't. You know, so I have to, like, and then they start looking at me like, I'll lay you out. Um, uh, so I went down to St. Petersburg and a ton of Southerners, and I, within four months, had the most schizophrenic accent of all time. I would come back, and I would be like, y'all want to go out for a beer? <laughs> and so all anybody did was make fun of me. So I finally just said, I had taken a class. My first college was Emerson College, and I had to take a class called Voice and Articulation. Everybody had to take it. And so I took it, and I had learned how to lose my accent, but I wouldn't lose it. I was too, like, you know, now I'm, I'm a city boy. So the, once I got tired of taking a lot of crap for my bizarre accent, I just, I concentrated really hard, and within a couple of months, I had no accent at all. So. Guys, yeah, kid, how you doing, kid? <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. I, now with my children, I have to be very uh, regimented. And so I write every morning. I get up as soon as I can get to my desk. I don't take, um, I was doing things like taking my daughter to school or, or walking her in the mornings or something like that. And I realized it was doing a lot of damage to me as a writer. I wasn't getting work done. Uh, the magic is um, most writers write in the morning or very late at night or use substances because it's the closest you can get to the dream state. That's the idea. So I do the mornings because you're still kind of in a dream. You've woken up. The world isn't with you yet. Fastest you can get to your desk, the better you are. The better you can create. The better you can. And you get, I would say, one hour in the morning will be worth more than 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 two hundred hours you could get in an afternoon. So I, I believe that because then the world's too much with you, and you pulling all that rust off you. You need to get to the desk as fast as possible. So that's what I do. Um, and then I work for three hours minimum. I don't, I don't stop for three hours, even if I only write a line. I know writers who say, I never leave the room unless I've written 1,200 words. And I'm like, but shouldn't they be the right 1,200 words? I mean, I'd rather write the right 300. And, and just, you know, it'll take me a little longer to finish a book than then, you know, write a, you know, I used to, there was a writer who was famous for saying, I write all my books in 40 days, to which I would say, it shows, you know. <laughs> so, anybody? Yes, sir? Some of my favorite authors, um, the, the authors who most influenced me tended to be um, urban novelists. I think at the end of the day, that's, that's what I feel I am at my, in my core, of course. Um, so people wrote about cities, I'd say Richard Price is the biggest and then um, Pete Dexter, Nelson Algren, James T. Farrell, uh, Hubert Selby, William Kennedy, Elmore Leonard. Um, and then I think also then people who were a big influence on me, but mostly because of what he wrote, he wrote about the working class, and he doesn't get a lot of credit for this, is uh, Raymond Carver, the short story writer. I mean, he gets a lot of credit for changing short fiction and minimalism and a lot of things, but he was writing about very marginalized people. And that's what I feel like I write about. That's what I feel like I'm most comfortable writing about. So, Oh, yeah, Pete Hamill's great. I, I love, um, the other thing I would say is I was heavily influenced by the great columnists. To this day, urban columnists like Mike Royko, Jimmy Breslin, Pete Hamill, kind of Mike Barnacle in, in Boston. Uh, I still love, there's a, there's a woman in Boston, Yvonne Graham, who writes for the Boston Globe, who is one of the best urban co columnists I've ever read. And I read her religiously. Even when I'm living in Florida, I look her up online. When I'm back in Boston, I read the, the hard copy. So, yeah, I, I, um, then everybody else. Then it's the usual suspects. Then you get into, like, you know, you get into, you know, Edith Wharton and F. Scott Fitzgerald and Dostoevsky and, and Raymond Chandler. And, you know, there's a lot of other influences. But the people who just, like, clearly I was like, these are the people I want to emulate are those people. So, yes, sir. How did I come up with the Babe Ruth? Okay, the, the book The Given Day opens with a 30-page chapter, about well, it's close to 30 pages, about Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was coming back from, um, I'd come across an anecdote. The Babe Ruth, when he was coming back from the World Series of 1918, was split into two homestands they, they, because of the war. So they played the first three in Chicago, and the last four were supposed to be played in Boston. So on the train back, all the Cubs and the Red Sox were all together, and uh, which normally wouldn't happen, but it was due to travel restrictions. So um, Ruth... I heard an anecdote, which is pretty well documented, that Ruth got drunk, and no surprise, and started uh, punching out people's hats. And, I, and he ended up getting in a beef with somebody about it, and he took a swing at them, and he missed, and he hit the, his, his um, 
fist hit the wall of the train, and he couldn't pitch the next day. He was scheduled to pitch. He was scratched. So I had that in my head. And so I just wrote that because what I really wanted to write about, I was writing a book about unions. And what happened with the Chicago Cubs and the Red Sox is when they got on that train together, all together, they realized they were being screwed by the owners. And so they, did, they, they refused to come out the next day. So the second strike in the history of Major League Baseball happened at the 1918 World Series. And that's what I wanted to write about. I wanted to say this was all in the air. Like this was a year of unionism, you know, and it started at the World Series. And it ended with the Boston police strike. So that's where it started. And then like a lot of wonderful things that happen when I write, which I love, it just opened up wide on me. I, I, it was supposed to be a six-page chapter. And then suddenly Ruth walked into a field and he heard somebody playing baseball. And he walked out and he found these, these, these black baseball players. And then it just became this kind of chance to play with myth. And so the white baseball players come out and they start playing the black guys. And the black guys are better than them. And so they start beating them, and then it becomes this issue of how, how do you win? How does white America win in that circumstance? They cheat. You know what I mean? So it, it became to define the book in a lot of different ways. And I just said, and nobody, so many people didn't want that chapter in. That chapter uh, lost me, I think, at least six foreign publishers uh, because nobody, nobody cares about baseball in Europe. So they're like, mon Dieu, what is this? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Shit, you know? Uh, it's baseball. Just, just figure it out. I wrote the chapter so that if you didn't understand a thing about baseball, you could understand what the stakes were. That was the point. So um, I just feel like I understand why the Ruth stuff is in that book, and, and I, I feel as, at an autistic level um, very secure. I know why I did that. And I feel, The Given Day is my book book, is the way I put it. People say, when is that becoming a movie? I say, never. You know? And the rights are now in my hands. I don't think I'll ever sell it. Because to me, it's a book. It's meant to be engaged the way old books were meant to be engaged. It's meant to take you on a very long journey. And it asks something of the reader. You are asked to bring a little effort to the given day. It's not like, you know, this book takes off like a bullet, you know. So that's a little different. That's me taking you by the hand and saying, come on on a ride. The given day is saying, meet me at least a little halfway here. And a lot of people chose not to, which is fine. Um, but to me, I look at that book on my shelf and I just, my, my library, it's the only, you can only tell, in fact, you can't tell really. If you walk into my house, you really can't tell I live there. Um, it, it, seriously, I don't do the things that a lot of writers do. I don't have like posters of me. I just find that kind of geeky, you know. Uh, but um, but I, at my books, and I look at the given day. For some reason, I look at that in my library and I just go, that's a book. And I want it to stay that way forever. I'm really thinking I'm never going to sell the rights. And people say only two things to me about The Given Day, which I think is great. The, the good one is people come up and they'll say, it's one of my favorite books of the last five years or something like that. Just thank you so much. You know? Or they'll say, yeah, I started it. Um, I will get back to it. You know, it just kind of like, you know, it just kicks you out after a certain point unless you commit to it. So thank you. Yes, sir. The question. What was the biggest impact that yeah. writing programs and everything had on me? Well, there's a couple. The biggest one is people say, well, you know, what did it get you going to get a master's degree? You would already, I'd already had a book accepted for publication by, no, I already had an agent by that point. I didn't have a book yet accepted, but um, it bought me two more years to hide from the world and concentrate on my craft, which is huge. If you're trying to be a writer, the hardest thing in the world is to try and fit that into the rest of your life, you know? Um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for me, and it's my profession. You know what I mean? It's my job now. And still, it's kind of like, no, honey, I'm working. You know, I have to get an office because people aren't built for it. They don't understand. If you're in your house, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much your wife understands over the dinner table the night before. The next morning, it's, honey, could you just give me a hand for a second? Honey, could you, you know, it's too easy. So that's my life, which is comparatively easy because I can at least turn to her and go, this pays the mortgage, you know what I mean? So I need to work now, honey. Think about the poor people who can't. The people who say, no, honey, I need to write. No, you need to do your job, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and you need to change the baby and you need to, so it's tough. So if you get these two years where you get to just hang around with a bunch of other geeks like you, you know, it's just, I always say we're all mutants, you know? We sit around and we argue about gerunds, you know? And, and Joyce's use of irony in the final sentence of Araby, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's we stu stupid stuff that nobody cares about. 
we geek out on this, you know, and and to be with like-minded lunatics is wonderful. Um, the other thing I would say is when I was finishing up, gra right as I was sort of in the middle of graduate, I shouldn't say finishing up, um, we were coming to sort of the beginning of a dissatisfaction movement that had been probably building for years, which was we were tired of the story of literary fiction being defined by the story of the vaguely dissatisfied in Connecticut, right? Which is just, we were just tired of those stories. I mean, all of us were just like, I remember being in grad school saying, if I read one more friggin' story in the New Yorker that starts with two rich yuppies in a well-appointed kitchen suffering from malaise, I'm going to blow my brains out, you know? Um, so what was going on in the country at that time, I think, without any of us knowing it, was there was a whole bunch of us doing that. So there was a whole bunch of us with what would previously be called literary chops who were moving towards genre fiction. And we didn't know, we'd never had it, we didn't know each other, we'd never had a council, you know. But we just, I think a lot of us said, crime, fi I write about violence. I write about violence, I write about cities. I'm fascinated by why people do sort of mortal things. The crime fiction genre was perfect for somebody who at that point had no idea how to write a novel. I didn't, I didn't know how. I'd never been taught. I'd been taught how to do beautiful language. I'd been taught how to do, you know, a million different things, but I'd never been taught how to write a novel. So I said, well, I think in crime fiction, something bad has to happen. And by the end, you have to sort of deal with that. That's a plot. I can work that. Um, so that's how I ended up in, in crime fiction. So the final thing I would say that happened to me as a writer that was galvanizing was my final year of graduate school, three books came out that I thought were shook the world in my world, which was um, Clockers, Richard Price's novel about the crack trade. And I thought, if, if this isn't the greatest American novel of the year, then what the hell is everybody writing about? This is crack. This is tearing our country apart. Who's doing it? He writes a 600-page Dostoevsky and epic about it. And it just kind of got poo-pooed. And it was like, wow, OK. And then The Pugilist at Rest by Tom Jones, a collection of short stories, and All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy. Three books about really big, big things, what Cormac McCarthy calls fiction immortal event. And I remember in that moment saying, I'm stepping over this fence. I know exactly which side I stand on on this issue. And also because I don't write the small story very well. I'm not good at it. People who do do it, the like Alice McDermott's of the world, my hat is off to them. I love what you do, but it's not something I do. You know, I just sooner or later, somebody in one of my stories is going to hit somebody with a brick. You know, it's just... <laughs> So that, I think, those were the sort of, that, that was a big moment for me to say, this is where I want literature to go. This is the literature I want to do. I don't want to do the vaguely dissatisfied in Connecticut story anymore. I don't want to do people sitting around, you know, with these pregnant pauses. You know, Bill, Jane, he smoked a cigarette. She darned his socks. A week later, they were divorced. You know, I, I don't... I just, I, you know, I'm lost on that type of story now. So, yeah. Other, okay, yes, miss. I have a new imprint, yeah, I, I am a publisher now. I have Dennis Lehane Books out of uh, Harper, Harper Collins, and um, uh, I picked one book so far, which is just published, The Cutting Season by Attica Locke, which is a terrific book. Um, the way I'm, pi the only mandate is, um, I don't know how else to put this, that the book have, uh, what I, I just call them the, the Ds, that, it, that, that they just be clear depth of character, depth of language, depth of structure, and depth of insight. You know, that, that I don't care what genre they're in. I don't care if it's written by a woman. I don't care if it's written by a man. I don't care if it's Southern. I don't care if it's Northern. I don't care if it's from Czechoslovakia. I, I just want that. And so, so far, that's led me to exactly one book. And I'm just going to keep going. Hopefully, it'll keep going, but, but you know, Maybe it won't, but they asked me to do it. They just, my publisher contacted me. I've been with the same publisher now for 17 years. And we're all, like, we truly are like a family. Usually you hear that's like a cliche, but in my case, it is actually true. The people who are at the top now were people who were at the bottom when I started. We all rose together. We're all really super tight. And so the head of publishing is a friend of mine, and he just said, somebody said it aboard me. We should do an do a imprint. I thought, if we're going to do an imprint, can we do one with you? I like your taste. And I was like, my taste isn't really commercial, Michael. And he's like, we'll be fine, you know. So I don't know, we'll see, you know, because <laughs> my taste isn't terribly commercial. I'll say, if I like you, you're headed for the remainder bin. 
Um, you know, if I, you know, it's just, it's so funny. I watched, uh, uh, people were telling me all summer, oh, you got to go see the Avengers. You got to go see the Avengers. And I'm like, I barely get out of the house, you know, because I got the kids. And, and so I managed to get out to see a movie, but I saw it three times. I saw this movie called, uh, The Beast of the Southern Wild. I saw the movie three times in the summer. And I think the movie made a total of like six million dollars. And I, I probably contributed like 10,000 of that, seen it three times. Um, but then I finally did see the Avengers, and I was like, wow, this is what everybody was talking about? I, I'm lost. So that's my problem, is my tastes are not mainstream. You know, I'm, I'm, as a writer, I think I'm a better, I'm closer to the mainstream than I am in any other way, as a writer, but as a, as a, as a, you know, an arbiter of taste, my tastes are very much more towards the avant-garde. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Well, it's one third in Boston, and then it's Tampa. Yep. No, I wanted to write a book, gangster book. I was dying to write a gangster book. I've been dying since I was uh, probably a little kid. And um, with uh, Live by Night, uh, as I was finishing up the given day, I thought, "There's this little kid in there. He's got the DNA of a ga ga gangster. There's my gangster, and he'll be the perfect age, prohibition and everything." And I knew it wasn't going to be a sequel. I don't want it to be connected to the given day in any way, shape, or form, unless. If you've read The Given Day and you read this book, you go, oh, that's what happened to so-and-so. That's nice. But if you've never heard of The Given Day, you read Live By Night, you just go, wow, that was great. And then somebody says, oh, there's another book? Oh, that's cool. So I wanted to write this gangster book with Joe Coughlin. But the problem was I love the gangster genre. That doesn't mean you will if I don't bring something new to the table. And it just seemed like every story was told. And then there was Boardwalk Empire. And then there was you know, just all of a sudden it got hot again with the Daniel Okrent book and the Ken Burns documentary. And suddenly it was this prohibition, prohibition, prohibition. And I thought, what am I going to bring to the table that's new? And I stalled on the book. I wrote two chapters and I didn't write anything for a year. And I live in St. Petersburg part of the year. And I have went to meet a friend in Ybor City, which is part of um, Tampa. And it's the part of Tampa that was once where all the cigar manufacturing, um, uh, where all the cigar manufacturers were, it's 35 of them. And what it was, was it was this area that was in the 1920s Filled is predominantly Cuban, Spanish, and Italian. And those were considered all the swarthy races that nobody wanted anything to do with. So they said, if you guys stay down here and you never leave and never come out into white Tampa, we'll leave you be. Knock yourselves out. So Ebor became this really tight, close-knit community in which everybody revolved around kind of cigar making and then music and then because of the Cuban influence and then... Um, and then suddenly, I was walking around Ebor one morning to meet this friend, and I looked at it. It's beautiful. It looks like New Orleans. And it's very well preserved, which is unheard of in Florida. Anybody who knows Florida, they get so much. The, the strip mall gets a paint peeled. They bulldoze it, and they put up a Hooters. And <laughs> Ebor looks exactly as it did in 1920. And I flashed on it when I was waiting for this friend of mine, and I went, rum. This is where all the rum came in. Everybody else does whiskey. Capone is whiskey. The Untouchables is whiskey. Boardwalk Empire is whiskey. Kansas City, when you think Kansas City, Detroit, New York, all of those gun battles, Tommy Guns, Jimmy Cagney movies, everything, that was whiskey. Nobody has done rum since Hemingway, with the have and the have not. And I went, they used to sneak it in. I, rem I remember they used to sneak it in through Port of Tampa up through tunnels that they built under Ybor City. They'd distill it in the backs of restaurants and pharmacies running across to Jacksonville and up the eastern seaboard. And I went, there's my book. That's it. So it wasn't like I wanted to get out of Boston. It was I had to get out of Boston. And then when I discovered that, I said, I'm doing something different. I'm doing, I want to do a gangster novel that has a Latin flair. I want it to be sexy. I want it to be real. I, I remember that feeling right from the beginning. I was like, this book's going to be sexy. I want this to be sensual and fun and, and, and just have a kick, have a Latin kick to it. So I said, I'm all, my only plan was, the rum route was Havana to Tampa to Boston. And I said, I'm going to do Boston, Tampa to Havana. That's the only plan I had for this book when I sat down to write it. And I wrote it in four months with that plan. So I guess it worked. Uh, I'm just going to take somebody over here first. Yes, sir? Yeah, it's the irreconcilable dilemma is what it's called. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Oh, no, definitely. Certainly in my books, there, there's a common theme of there not being necessarily an easy answer or a right answer. Um, that probably comes from Jesuits. I was, you know, went to Jesuit high school. Um, 
but it's also just comes from this sense of I'm fascinated with what's known as the irreconcilable dilemma, and and that is that you know yes this this was the right thing to do, but yet it's wrong. You know, it's right. Uh, so let's say it's right intellectually, but it's wrong emotionally. It's right emotionally, but it's wrong intellectually. Um, that that fascinates me. It also, I think, the older I get, the more I'm stunned by how much we're oversimplifying things in our culture right now, and it angers me. And it's probably bubbling up through my books. I just find that people, you know, oversimplification of things. You know, it's the Bible line. When I was a child, I thought as a child, and I spake as a child. But I put away childish things. The world is so much more complex then particularly the media now is portraying it, and everything is just split down these simplistic lines, and it drives me insane. We live in an excessively complex world, and if you can't handle nuance, then drop out of the human race, or please don't vote, you know? <laughs> uh, um, so that's, I think, what, what ends up in my work, you know? So final question, this gentleman right here, yes. How did I get the Latin flair? Well, I, I, I got it from the fact that... Um, this is going to sound really terrible, but I'm just going to be honest. What the hell? I, I, I've always had the hots for Latin women. And um, I, like brunette, my wife, is constantly confused with the Cuban. Uh, I, she's Italian, but uh, I, I am just in love with, um, it sounds stupid, I'm just in love with dark-haired women. And so it started there. You know, you start with what you, I'm, I'm like, really, I think dark-haired women are sexy. You start there. Where are there dark-haired women? Latin quarters. Where there's a Latin quarter? Tampa. You know, on and on and on. That's how it just became. Uh, and I feel comfortable with it because I went to school in Miami and taught in Miami. So I understand it at a base level in so much as a gringo can understand it. I understand a base level of it. And I didn't want to be sort of a tourist, but I was like, I'm writing about a quarter of this country that, uh, or section of this country that at that time was this sizzling hotbed of sort of, um, of Latin influences, if you will. And, and it's going to end up in Havana, and I'm just, going to, I'm just going to follow that path. But I was really, what I wanted to write about is, Ebor to me, at the end of the day, what it stood for back then, I'm, a child, I'm the child of an immigrant, and I take that as very seriously. I, I feel, feel a very strong debt to that. And America, to me, is the melting pot. That's the point. That is absolutely the point. So when all of us mix, we have America. And when we all balkanize off and hide in our little areas where everybody's white or everybody's this or everybody's that, that to me is decidedly un-American. And so with Ebor, I was like, I have a community that to me represents America. And I can play with it. And it's also, then the final thing, I'll give you the final hint in sort of understanding how I got all fired up about the book is, the other thing it did for me is, Ebor was filled with revolutionaries, gun runners, musicians, radicalized union cigar workers and and people who were very told very clearly by society you don't fit and i said that's casablanca that's the movie casablanca and that is what i tried to do in the middle section of this book is i want it to feel like casablanca i want you to feel the smoke i want you to feel like everybody's cool and everybody looks good and there's music pouring out of every cafe and what a time it was to be alive that kind of thing so that's um that was what I was trying to do. I hope that answered the question. That was very involved, strange. My wife's going to kill me for talking about my attraction to dark-haired women. But anyway, <laughs> uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you.